This is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of July 2nd, 2019. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael on Tuesdays from 6.20 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, and SoundCloud pages, and on my website at bgkeithley.com. You can find past episodes of the Weekly Top 3 also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we discuss the governor's vetoes and how they play out from here. Second, we need to be honest with ourselves. Someone is going to be taxed. We need to be talking about who. And third, the UA system needs to start thinking ahead after it fails to land its Hail Mary. And now, let's join Michael. And every week, Brad Keithley comes aboard to talk with us about oil, gas, the economic impact, infrastructure, and so much more. This week, we're talking all about the budget cuts, the vetoes, how the spending levels are uh, continuing, and the situation at the University of Alaska. That's all part of our weekly top three. But uh, I was just talking with Brad as he came on, and he said, uh, you know, I said, uh, good thing you're out of state. You're missing all the hubbub as far as the weeping and wailing. And he said, no, no, he's getting all the calls and everything, uh, you know, uh, single calls from people saying, if you would just support or endorse this one program, it would make all the difference. And I just said, Brad, isn't that the death of reason? If he would just support my program. I mean, that's how we got here, right? It is. It's exactly how we've got here. It's, it's you know, you got 60 legislators. They each have just one or two special programs that their constituents really need, really rely on. Uh, they're willing to make cuts. They're willing to make the hard decisions, but just don't cut my program. And by the time you multiply that through 60 legislators and however many other influencers that you've got out there, you end up with budgets like we've had since since 2014 or since 2010, actually. So it's it it, it 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 is. I mean, each individual call, you know, or each individual uh, message I get, and each individual discussion I have, the person makes a fairly you know compelling case about why that project is special. But once you start down that road, once you start saying, "Oh, well, I understand we've got to you know save the arts," or "I understand we've got to do that," or "I want to understand we've got to do the other thing," once you agree to that. The barn doors open because every every one of the sixty are then going to say, "Well, I just have this one program that we need to change," and we're right back uh, to the full on budget that we've been that we've been having since 2010. So, right. you know, my my response across the board has been, uh, "I understand the point. Uh, you you need to you need to up your game on private sector uh, fundraising." Uh, because from for my money, these vetoes are going to stand. I'm going to back every one of them. I'm not going to break ranks here and say, oh, well, let's pinprick that one and pull it out. Right. Well, as I said earlier, we could have a legislature full of nothing but smaller government, you know, quote unquote Republicans, and we'd still be facing the same problem because this is what happens when we get to that. Like you said, each individual legislator has their own pet project and you get 60 of them and all of a sudden you've got a huge budget. That's what happens each time. Um, yeah, I, th I think the governor. I think the governor has made a very good call. Uh, you know, frankly, we'll talk about in the second segment. I, the cuts don't go deep enough to avoid taxes, but I think the governor's made a very good call uh, on on an across the board sweep um, of, of vetoes. Everybody's going to be unhappy. Everybody's going to have a pet project that they want that they want to protect. But frankly, I don't. I don't think any one uh, uh, organization or any one thing has been unfairly singled out here. When you when you look across the board, I think he's done a fairly good job of of making a broad based uh, uh, sweep of cuts that that are fair, understandable, 
um, and and move the ball forward in terms of in terms of reducing spending, uh, which we have to do. So I'm, I the weeping and wailing is just people individually going, people individually putting one project, singling out one project, and saying, oh my God, this one, you know, this project's the most, or this thing's the most important thing in the world. It's it's what drives life in Alaska, um, and we have to preserve it. I don't care about that other stuff, but this one thing <laughs> is what we have to, is what drives life in Alaska. And we have, to, we have to have a much broader perspective on these things. Absolutely. Well, let's dive down into it. The weekly top three, uh, the vetoes, how are they really affecting the state um you know when it's overall give us your thoughts overall here on the veto this is the first time we got a chance to really chat about it since it happened well as i said i think i think they're an excellent sweep uh of 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 things that that can be cut as as i also said as we'll get into in the second segment they don't go deep enough to avoid taxes we're, we're gonna we need to have this tax discussion uh but i think they're an excellent sweep at um, at, at things that can be cut. The university, you and I have been on this for gosh, only knows how many years. I mean, we have, we have a use university system we can't afford. We have a university system that, that has been funded at 250% of the national average. Um, and it, and it is a system that is, redu is redundant in, 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 by its very nature. It's got three separate, uh, instances trying to support three separate, universities, three separate uh, in, uh, institutions, um, and, and has, has been on the radar as, as something that needs to be consolidated uh, for a long time. Uh, you've got uh, uh, school reimbursement, uh, which frankly is, is a decision that you know, some people are going to, or is a, a, a pro project that, that some people are going to focus on and say, oh, we've got we've to push back on that. I mean, the, the state owes those monies. Um, and and you know the localities can't can't take them on, but frankly, they're, they're they were local decisions. Part of the irony of this is in the Matsu is that is that Mike Dunleavy was on the school board when uh, when frankly they made some of those decisions to build some of those buildings. They're not going to have to they're not going to have to pay for themselves. Um, and 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 he's pushing he's pushing costs back on the locality that he voted for. Uh, when he was on the school board, but but it's it's what you have to do. I mean, the state the state only has a limited amount of money. The localities made those decisions to build those buildings. Uh, they need to step up and and finance them. It's this is not a shocker. I mean, the the statute said from the from the from the beginning, and the and the bonds themselves said from the beginning, or the bond votes said from the beginning that that the localities might have to pay a portion of these costs. Well. We've come to a point where the localities are going to have to pay pay for a portion of those costs. So I, so I I think that's a that's an understandable uh, uh, decision on his part. Um, probably, if it were me, I would have uh, I would have wiped out state support entirely as the original Dunleavy budget proposed. Uh, but he's uh, come back in response to what the legislature did and is only taking out half this time. Um, half of state support. So there's still state support in there, about 40, what, $44 million, something like that. Um, and so that's still uh, uh, going to be state support to the to localities on those. Arts funding, I mean, I, I, I've got a lot of friends. I, I Obviously, I go to concerts. I'm a, I'm a big supporter of the arts community. Uh, wiping out the State Arts Council is a uh, is a big deal to them. They're, you know, that's that's part of the calls I'm getting, part of the messages I'm getting. We got to save arts. Uh, we've got to save uh, grants to the arts. That you know, the art system in Alaska will uh, teeter on collapse if we don't do that. Uh, but but again, that's that's really where private fundraising uh, needs to step in. There are other states that don't have state support uh, to the arts community, we, we, and and those who, including me. <clears throat> Those who want to support the arts in the state need to step up and help help fill in that help fill in that detail. I've, I'm always amazed, frankly, when I go to concerts or when I go to theater uh, outside and I look at the list of donors and I look at the levels at which people are giving, um, and 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 then I compare that to the list of donors and to the levels that people are giving when I come back to Alaska. I, always amazed at the difference i mean right you've got we've got significant donors to the art to arts activities uh in other states 
that's how they're supported. That's how they that's how they operate. You come back to Alaska, and, and, and the list of the list of donors is fairly small, and and the amounts are are fairly small, um, and 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 we rely heavily on state support. So well, we, Brad, we, that's one of the things that we talked about yesterday with Donna Arduino, you know, kind of the death of this private sector giving, because they all assume that government is going to step in and fill the role. I mean, that's how. I mean, I think the Governor Dunleavy's comment on being all things to all people is an app is an appropriate. Uh, you know, response, because that's what's happened across the country. But I mean, here in Alaska specifically, as you mentioned, you're seeing a lot more of that because the government has had such deep pockets for so many years with all that high cotton oil money. Uh, that's kind of how it's been. But I mean, we're seeing that kind of across the country where the first thing they do is look to government instead of looking to their communities, to their supporters, to uh, at the universities, in the, the alumni, uh, patrons of the arts and things like that. We have forgotten about that private giving. If you support it, support it. If you don't, yeah. then don't. Yeah, it's really. I mean, it, if looking to government is really just avoiding the hard work, right? I mean, if if you have to sell, if you have to sell your product to the private sector, you have to go out and make a case for why your product's really good. You have to go out and make a case for for why it's a uh, uh, you know it's 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 more important than funding other things. Um, you have to you know really work your donors to to get them to to commit going to government you just go to a politician and you try to and you and you sell him on why he, it's politically advantageous to him uh or her uh, uh to be involved in supporting this project and then that they, they work the pro the, as one of 60 they work that project through the legislative function all of a sudden the money magically appears it's just it's a different type is a much easier type of work uh, to, uh, to run to 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 get this fun to get the funds from from government than it is to get it from uh, uh, from uh, from the private sector. Uh, right. Right. And, and, and so and so we're just really Alaska asking Alaska uh, or or maybe forcing Alaska, but but asking Alaska to sort of step up uh, its 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 responsibility on the private side and asking these organizations to step up their activity. Uh, on the private side. I mean, another good example, and, and we'll get into it in the third segment with, with the university, but another good example is the university. The University of Alaska has like the world's most horrible private giving uh, uh, function. Uh, there's a 2011 report that was done for the university uh, called the Fisher Report that, that frankly the university then tried to bury that has has a that was done at the time Pat Gamble became uh, uh, chancellor, um, and he commissioned this this study group to go in and look at the university and say tell him what could be done better. Um, and there's a big section on institutional advancement or development or fundraising um, in this report that basically says, you know, Alaska, y your program stinks. Um, <laughs> it, 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 it quotes one. It quotes one of the uh, of the faculty that they talked to uh, in developing the report is saying, "We don't need private fundraising. Raising we got Ted Stevens, and we yeah. got the state." Right, right. Well, that's and, again part of that problem. And and so and so the university's never developed that 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 capability, that private fundraising capability. The the report, the 2011 report said the president of the university's job, number one job, is to get out and, and get and get private fundraising. And you know, let others run the university. That's a fairly easy thing to do. The president needs to step out and be involved in private fundraising. Well, none of them have done it. Uh, they've always they've always relied on the state. They viewed their job their job as just you know coddling legislators and getting money out of the state. And as a result, you know you look at you look at Alaska's uh, uh, dependence, the Alaska the university's dependence on state giving. It's massively higher, 250 percent higher uh, than the national average because they haven't developed that private fundraising arm. Right. So yeah, we're, we're telling them. I mean, these cuts are are telling people across the board. Your job, your job at the local level with these with these school bond uh, reimbursement cuts, your job at the at the arts, your job at uh, at the university, your job is to go raise money from the private sector like other states do, and in in the pushback we're hearing is uh, I'm not sure I know how to do that. Um, geez, I've never developed that that capability. I've never had to do that before. I'm scared, mommy. What do I do?
So I hope you get a chance to relax a little bit and you don't keep getting too many more phone calls about how we just, if you would just support this one program, Brad, you could fix the well, world. You know, I, I sort of, in, in a perverse way, I sort of appreciate those those calls and 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 messages and chats um, because, frankly, it gives me an opportunity, I think, to help open eyes uh, on on the other side uh, who who are of those who are just sort of focused on their program. Now, understandably, it's their job, and understandably, they're focused on on their program and understand and understandably they're focused on uh, on their funding but it's an opportunity to have a discussion about you know it's not it's not just your program it's 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 your program and then and then and then the next program that's supported by the next legislator right and then and, and then spreads out to 60 and and none none of the conversations are good i mean none of the people are satisfied that uh, that that i won't kick in in, in support of their program but but at least it's an opportunity to to have that discussion, which I don't think we have a lot of uh, in the state. We we're very siloed. Uh, in, we seem to be very siloed in our thinking. Everybody's sort of focused on one thing or two things, and and and, and to the sort of the exclusion of everything else, and say, and saying, you know, my my program, my spending, that it's the most important thing in the world. It's how it's how the world. You know, it's what the world turns on, and they can't take away my spending. Uh, now, all that other stuff, yeah, okay, maybe maybe they can cut that, but they they can't take away my spending. Oh, and then it's an oppor- and then it's an opportunity, frankly, also to get into a discussion about the PFD, and and you know, people say, uh, well, you know, it's just a little bit out of the PFD, and and that's not a that shouldn't be a big deal. And again, you know, you then roll that into well. By the time you add everybody, everybody's uh, uh, claims up. It's a huge thing out of the PFD. And by the way, the PFD is a regressive tax. And what you're really asking, what you're really wanting to do is you want to fund your program on the backs of middle and lower income Alaska families. Let the top 20 percent get off with a trivial amount and non-residents earning Alaska or receiving Alaska income get off with zero. That's what you're really asking. You want to fund your program on the backs of right. middle and lower income Alaskans. Come on, Brad. Why do you hate the homeless? Do you want them to die? Is that what you're saying? I mean, that's what, Nata- well, that's what Natasha says. We're all going to die. Well, yeah, Natasha. I mean, so <laughs> Natasha's saying that, but she's not going to pay for it. No. I mean, as a, as, as a top 1%er or top 0.1%er, she's not going to pay. Her, the, the, the impact of the PFD cut on her is trivial. I mean, it's, 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 it's beyond trivial. Um, so what she's really saying is, I, you know, we really need to to fix this problem, but we need to fix it on somebody else's dime because I, I don't want to pay for it. I, I want to do right. this through PFD cuts because I don't want to pay, you know, any sort of tax for it. And and that's just that's sort of the that's sort of the thing I get into with everybody. Right. You know, it's it's I don't want to I don't want to pay taxes, but you know we got these PFDs <laughs> out there. We can just take that. Yeah, exactly. Regressive city. Brad asked or uh, William asked the question. He says, Brad, how do you uh, how do the vetoes affect the governor's leverage to get us our full PFD? We got about uh, a minute. Mm, I, you know, if the governor was willing to horse trade the vetoes um, in, 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 to reverse some of those by agreeing to capital spending increases or, or offsets of the capital bill, maybe it would it would affect that. But frankly, uh, I mean, it, it opens up additional money for the PFD. Uh, uh, it, uh, it, it reduces spending. It opens up money for additional PFD. But I don't think in terms of getting the legislature to agree to a full PFD, that's going to do it. Okay. We're, we're coming up against the break here, Brad. So, uh, I mean, I think we kinda, we, we've, we've hammered these cuts the last couple of days. We've kind of given people an idea of what, what they're looking at. Let's talk a little bit and give us a little bit of a tease here, uh, a, a one-minute tease on segment two, which is the cuts are great. You're saying they're not enough. We're still going to need more revenue, which means we're going to have to have the taxation discussion. I don't know if I'm there yet, but uh, this is what you're saying. Give us the one minute tease here before we jump to the break. Well, revenues are about $3.3 billion. Even the governor's budget is, uh, is $4.2 billion down significantly from where the legislature was, but still about, Eight hundred, nine hundred million dollars 
uh, above above traditional revenues, including the uh, the, the leftover piece uh, uh, from the from the POMV draw. Um, that's about three point three billion dollars. So there's a gap there, and and the gap has to be filled. Even if you're going to fill up from savings, that's a tax, and we'll discuss that after the break. But there's a gap of, of about $800, $900 million that has to be filled. It, the governor says this is year one of a two-year program. Frankly, I think I've heard uh, a, a two, that we have a two-year program or a three-year program every year since 2014. I, it's not that I'm not you know, saying that the governor won't make additional cuts next year. But but setting setting whether he does whether he gets additional cuts done or not we have a gap this year that has to be filled, and as a consequence there will be taxes as a result of that. It's just a question of who the taxes are going to fall on. Brad is saying now, taxes are an inevitability based on the spending level. Brad, flesh that out for us. Sure. So revenues. Um, uh, the traditional revenues from oil and from what we call other taxes, which is about uh, other historic taxes, which is half a billion dollars in revenue each year, uh, plus uh, the, 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 the amount remaining in the statutory calculation of the, P of, of the POMV and uh, the PFD, um, uh, which results in about $900 million coming over to the general fund. Um, Revenues are about $3.3 billion. Uh, 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 OMB puts it at $3.4 billion because I think they're using another a couple of sources that used to be have, are usually classified as DG revenue. I think they're putting their over to putting it over to to to, uh, to UGA revenue. So 3.3, 3.4, somewhere uh, in there, uh, uh, billion dollars. Spending the governor's spending is about. Uh, uh, when you include capital, uh, his his proposed 150 million dollars of UGF capital uh, spending is about 4.2 uh, billion dollars. So you get a there's a deficit, there's a difference there of about 800 to 900 uh, uh, million dollars. Um, that has to come from somewhere, and you know, and people sometimes say, oh, that'll just come from savings, that'll just come from an excess draw on the excess as in as in over and above the POMV that has come from a excess draw uh, from the earnings reserve account or a little bit will come from the CVR um, or maybe there's you know, a little little bit will come from what's left or what's remaining in the SBR um, and and we don't and we don't need to worry about that that's just coming from savings well draws from savings are taxes on future Alaskans uh, that money would otherwise be invested um, uh, uh, in some way, it would otherwise earn interest uh, not only this year, but in subsequent years uh, if it wasn't drawn away and used for spending. Uh, and it would otherwise generate additional earnings uh, uh, for future Alaskans. So, so drawing on savings, uh, uh, frankly, is just a tax on, on future Alaskans. Some people say we need to close the gap with uh, with additional draws or additional cuts in the PFD, that we need to balance that $900 million by cutting the PFD, um, and and that's the way we'll do it. Well, that's a tax uh, on, on Alaska families. It's a tax mostly on <coughs> – excuse me – tax mostly on middle and lower income Alaska families who will pay, pay the bulk of that, the top 20%. Pays a trivial, trivial amount. Non-resident uh, Alaskan in uh, uh, non-residents drawing Alaska income will pay zero. So it's, it's a it's a tax that falls mostly on middle and lower income Alaska families. So either of those approaches are taxes. One's a tax on future Alaskans. One's a tax on current Alaskans. As long as we have, <coughs> excuse me, as long as we have deficits. Uh, those deficits are going to be closed it, when you when you include uh, uh, the remainder of the of the of the uh, POMV in the calculation of revenues. As long as we have deficits, uh, those deficits are going to be closed with taxes on somebody. It's either going to be taxes on the future generation uh, or on the current generation. Now, Governor Dunleavy said in his presentation that this is year one that we're going to that we're going to make another leap in year two. Uh, and we'll get spending down even further. But Michael, let's be realistic. I mean, we, we've we've cut what well, we've cut maybe um, 
four point six is where the legislature and we we've cut maybe four hundred million dollars this governor through his through his uh, 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 PFD cuts uh, or I'm sorry through his uh, vetoes has cut maybe four hundred four hundred and fifty million dollars uh, from where the legislature was uh, ended up. We're talking about another eight hundred nine hundred billion dollars. We're not talking about any revenue increases coming next year. <coughs> the governor's own ten year forecast shows that revenues are, are staying flat. If anything, they're declining a little bit um, uh, in the near term. Uh, so we're not going to make up for this on the revenue side. We're not going to make up for that deficit on the revenue side. We this is this is the hell we're going through for about four hundred and fifty million um, uh, in cuts. You have to double that next year uh, to get down to spending. And and as I said, I've been you know I've been tracking this since 2010. We've been having this mantra about we're going to cut our way, we're going to cut government uh, since 2012. And every year since 2012, it's been ah, it's a two or three year plan. We're going to get there in two or three years. Just hang on. Um, and and you have you have year one where there are some not insignificant cuts. <coughs> Excuse me. So year one in which there are not some uh, not insignificant cuts, and then year two and year three just sort of fades out, and, and you know by the end of that cycle, somebody's saying, "Well, we're gonna have another two year plan." Right. Right. So we we've got a deficit now. This year, we're gonna have taxes on somebody to pay for this deficit, either either future generations, or the or the current generation through PFD cuts. That's the that's the. The, the, really the only proposal on the table of how to pay taxes with this current generation. And we're going to continue, let's be honest with ourselves at least, we're going to continue to have deficits in, in the future. And, and we're going to have to finance them in some way. My point is this, we're taxing, we're taxing somebody uh, uh, to pay for these deficits. We need, to, we need to be responsible and to step up and have a discussion around what's the best way to tax uh, to close to close this gap. I don't believe taxing future generations, kicking the can down the road to future generations and saying, yeah, we spend it, but you get to pay for it. I mean, that's like the federal government. That's, that, that to me is an irresponsible uh, uh, way to deal uh, with these deficits, to kick them down the road. As you and I discussed repeatedly, I don't think PFD cuts are a responsible way to close it. You're just pushing. Right. <coughs> I'm sorry. You're just pushing the burden off on middle and lower income Alaska families. You're not. You're not uh, 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 dealing with this issue equitably. You're just sort of using middle and lower income fam Alaska families as a dumping ground uh, to dump these costs on, so that so that we can continue spending and the top 20 percent can continue to tell themselves oh we've done the right thing we're continuing to spend but without stepping into the game themselves well and let's let's give you a chance here to take a drink of water while i ask this question because i think it's still valid people are in the chat room are asking you know uh, you know there's never a mention in all this of of oil taxes you know why are we not looking at you know taking all you know last time you said that that those kind of taxes would harm the future but don't other taxes as well i mean when it's all over, I mean, what about the the oil taxation issue? I mean, is there still some money on the table there as well? I, to me, I've done a lot of work in oil over the years. To me, um, uh, what we did in SB twenty one is set a competitive structure, and we've seen the benefits of that. We had a we had a decline curve before SB twenty one of about six to eight percent per year. We were losing that much production per year. And, and that means you're losing revenue, state revenue, and you're, and you're, you're, you're going downhill from a, from a revenue standpoint. What SB21 did was come in and reset the structure, the tax structure on a competitive basis. And, and we've seen the benefits of that. We've attracted investment. We've got new projects. We've got new production coming online. Uh, uh, the production the forecast production forecasts show instead of a 6 to 8% decline that we had before SB21, we're having, <coughs> excuse me, we're staying largely uh, uh, level, flat in terms of production, uh, if not a, a slight uptick as you as you get uh, toward the outer years of the of a ten year forecast. Um, so I so SB twenty one has done its job. It's attracted investment, and what that means for future Alaskans is they're going to have investment 
uh, development, production, and revenue in those future years that they weren't going to have uh, uh, it, uh, if we kept on the uh, kept on the ASINs format. Right. My concern what? is is increasing oil taxes is just going to flip us right back to the to the ASINs. Uh, situation, especially the way some people talk about dramatic cuts in oil taxes, right, or dramatic increases in oil taxes, We're, flip us right, flip us right back to ASIN. Um, so uh, Harold says the benefits. Come on, the production dropped below five hundred thousand for the first time in history. Is that a function of the taxes, exploration, production? What is it? Oh, it's 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 a it's a function of of decline in existing in existing fields. Uh, and we haven't yet seen the benefits of oncoming production from from the new fields, but uh, a, a drop below 500 million is is like a drop of one percent uh, uh, in in production levels. Under Aces, we were forecast to drop six seven percent per year. We were forecast under Aces um, uh, to be down to something like um, uh, the 300 million 350 million range. Um, that three hundred fifty thousand barrels a day. Yeah, okay, uh, range uh, by this point, uh, but we are we are we are you know still at the five hundred thousand barrel a day range. Um, you know, and I think that that's been the biggest heartburn with a lot of people as they look at it and they look at the billions of dollars that are you know foregone in this state on taxation through SB 21 and others, and they see that as, I mean, as lost opportunity, instead of taxing the the people themselves that, you know, we're not getting enough for our resource on the way out the door. But you're saying that this sets us up for future? Is that is that what we're talking about? This sets us up for well, future production? Yeah. So if you look, if you look five or 10 years down the road, and you're looking at five, a continuation of 500,000 barrels a day, versus 350,000 barrels a day. That's 150,000 barrels a day. Uh, and the revenue on that 150,000 uh, barrels uh, uh, going to the benefit going to the benefit of future Alaskans. If we take that money out now, if we say, oh, we're going to increase taxes, we don't care about ongoing investment, we don't care about um, ongoing development, we're just going to we're just going to harvest out the benefit uh, of having oil by by raising taxes um, and and accept the fact that investment's going to go elsewhere. Um, that's fine. This generation will be better off because we'll have higher taxes. But we're doing it at the at the cost of future generations uh, by by significantly affecting uh, the revenue levels, the production levels, and the revenue revenue levels that future generations will have to have have available to them. And as and as a result, they'll have to tax themselves even harder or cut. Spending even more uh, to deal with uh, with the uh, the drop in in revenues in those out years because we haven't maintained investment um, in oil development. So it's to me it to me it's the same thing um, as 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 you know taking money out of the permanent excess draws out of the permanent fund earnings reserve. You're essentially taking money. From future generations that that otherwise will you're taking things that otherwise will generate money for future generations, you're essentially taking that to the benefit of the current generation, um, and making our lives easier, the current generation easier, but at the expense of uh, but the expense of future generations, and and I, you know, some people say that's some people that say that's okay, that let future generations fend for themselves, but I. I don't think that's I don't think that's a responsible approach. I think each generation should should pay for itself uh, uh, on its own bottom uh, instead of just stealing money from future generations. Brad Keithley is our guest, Alaska's for sustainable budget. Let's change topics just a little bit. Nina says, um, is it likely that the suits will fight and push and drag this whole PFD thing? Uh, to the point nothing gets paid out this year in October. I'm starting to think they will get nothing because they will continue to dig their feet in like children. What say you? Well, that's a possibility. I mean, the legislature has to pass a PFD before there will be a PFD. According to the Supreme Court, the legislature has to appropriate uh, a PFD. And if and if we have a, uh, you know, a standoff between the governor and the legislature where the legislature just refuses to pass uh, a PFD unless the governor does certain things or unless certain lawsuits are settled or unless certain things go the legislature's way, 
if they just absolutely refuse to pass a PFD, there's nothing the governor can do to, um, uh, to, to force that PFD to be paid. So th there, is, there is more than a negligible uh, uh, potential that, that we do get to October. There still hasn't been a PFD authorized or appropriated by the legislature, and there isn't a PFD to be paid. So, Brad, we talked about the vetoes. We talked about the fact that the cuts are not going to be deep enough to avoid taxation in the future, maybe immediate or, or near-term future. And now we've got the final uh, of the three, which is, you know, what really is the deal with the university? The U needs to plan as if it doesn't – is this, it's not going to get this money. Where are we at on this? Well, Michael, the, the university – Budget, the university uh, uh, veto is sort of the ultimate battleground. We, we, you and I have talked about on the show for a long time that if you can't cut the university, if you can't make cuts in the university budget, you're, you're not going to be able to cut anything because the university budget is 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 the uh, best example of of overbuilt, overfunded. Uh, uh, that we have, it, at least to me, that we have in Alaska government. It's it's 250 percent. We're funding the university system uh, 250 percent above the national average uh, of what state legislatures fund their state universities. Um, it is uh, we have three universities. We build up three universities uh, when the Constitution, at least, uh, uh, only contemplated one. Uh, it is. It is has spread itself uh, across the state uh, through its through its community uh, uh, campuses uh, in a way that just makes it a gigantic presence. And if you if we if in a time of of reeling state government back in reeling back in what 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 we do to sort of the core uh, of, of of what's necessary to, to to function as a state government. If we can't bring the university with its 250% uh, spending level uh, above national average, if we can't bring the university back uh, uh, back to ground, um, uh, then then we're not going to be able to do anything. Because what once once you agree that well, yeah, maybe we ought to let the university go, maybe we ought to let it um, uh, 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 have uh, have the extra funding, uh, let it maintain 250% uh, of national average. Uh, once you do that, I, the, the, the logic and the argument for sort of the, the cuts every place else sort of fall apart. I mean, well, if we're going to let the university have, you know, 250 percent funding, why can't we have just a little bit for the arts? Why can't we have why can't we have full school uh, uh, bond uh, reimbursement? Why can't we have uh, those additional Medicaid programs? I mean, once the once the university, once that lead domino falls, um, uh, I don't know. I don't know where it stops. I don't think it does stop. I think. I think all the exceptions start start uh, start uh, uh, taking precedence, and and sort of the overall picture uh, gets lost. So, to me, um, if the uh, if the legislature doesn't uphold the vetoes on the university, and and keep in mind, the governor's not cut um, uh, the university down to national average. He's not saying. That we ought to be only spend that the legislature ought to be spending only national average. I mean, the governor's budget uh, uh, or proposal still funds the university at about 140 to 150 percent um, of national average. Uh, if the legislature uh, can't uphold the vetoes uh, uh, for bringing the university spending down to something closer to something closer to earth, um, something closer to to normalcy. Um, in these times, then then I don't I don't think the will's there uh, to to frankly you know to, to frankly bring government uh, the size of government back down. So it, uh, overall, so I, I think we just we end up with these higher spending levels, and I think you know we're going to have to have even a more serious conversation about taxation. Well, it's, um, so so well, the university is sort of the fulcrum, and 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 and, and I can't believe. That we're not going to be able to, that the governor's not going to be able to muster at least 16. Uh, I would expect more than 20 uh, to uphold the veto uh, on the university system. Well, and and I think we we see this this whole commentary about how everything's devastating and uh, you know this uh, and the governor was very thoughtful in his cuts. You could see it in his cuts and in our discussion yesterday with Donna Arduin, the uh, 
uh, OMB director, she talked about how the cuts were directed specifically at the larger campuses. I mean, UAA and UAF, while excluding UAS and a lot of the community campuses because they have been more effective and efficient with what they're doing. But again, the university president, and they've already said that they're going to spread the pain. They already said that they're going to furlough pretty much, uh, you know, a lot of those people out in those areas who are being efficient. Uh, but you've talked about this in the past, how, for example, the University of Alaska Fairbanks, there's inequitable subsidies going on in the system. University of Alaska, we're $30,000 plus per student in subsidies for UAF versus like UAA or or the University of Alaska in Matsu. I mean, it's it's pretty amazing, how, you know, how these things are, you know, and there's been warnings. They've been talking about this for a long time. In 2016, Tammy Wilson uh, there was language written into the funding bill that said you guys need to start talking about, uh, you know, bringing yourselves down to a manageable level uh, with a single university system, and nobody wanted to listen. Yeah, well, again, I go back to 2011. I mean, we were talking about the Fisher report earlier. The, the in 2011, the Fisher report said you guys really need to up your game on private private fundraising. You can't rely on the state uh, to this level. Um, uh, in, 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 in an ongoing basis, that's just not going to be sustainable. Um, and the university ignored that. And then they ignored, um, I mean, they went through a shell game in 2016 in response to the, the provisions that Tammy had inserted, uh, but it was sort of a rope-a-dope strategy, right? I mean, it was, we'll study them until people forget them. Uh, and then we'll, then we'll keep on going. Um, and, and sort of, and governor Walker let him get away with that by continuing to fund, uh, at the higher levels. So yes, I, yes, it is going to, when, when you've, when you've built, uh, a, a structure, an institutional structure based upon 250% of national average, and you're going to get cut down to 150%. Yeah. It's going to be significant. Yeah. It's going to take some pain. You've, you've, you've built too big a structure. You're, you're, you've teetered it on state funding. That's unsustainable. Um, your, 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 your day has finally come. The day of reckoning has finally come. You didn't prepare for it. Yeah, it's going to, it's going to be tough, but if we don't make those cuts and, and, and believe me, I mean, I've had people say, well, just give us one more year. I've seen this movie folks. I mean, I've seen, I've seen the rope dope work. I saw it in 2016. Yeah. Just give me one more year, one more year, one more year. And, 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 and then, you know, sort of fades out of memory and, 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 and we're right back at, you know, 250%. If we don't make these cuts, if the legislature doesn't stand up and support the governor uh, on, on these cuts in particular, we are not going to, we are not going to make significant cuts in this state. This, this is the prime example of where we've gone overboard um, uh, in state funding. And if we can't get the university back under control, we're not going to get state government back under, back under control at all. So, Brad, uh, let's wrap up here uh, and, and take a look. So we've talked about the vetoes. We've talked about the possibility of taxation. We really, I mean, we didn't really mention much a little bit. You know, of course, flat taxes is the ones that we've talked about for a long time. If there has to be that discussion, that has to be. And now the university. But let's wrap things up uh, and talk, uh, you know, how do we help? How do we, the average listener who's listening to the program right now, how how do we make a difference? How, how do we how do we hold the line on this? I think I think now is is the most critical time uh, of of all of the times. The governor has clearly laid out a plan. It's clearly up to the legislature whether they agree to that plan or not. You need sixteen legislators to hold the line, and and each of us has some. I mean, every listener has some relationship with, with, with some legislator that's likely to support the governor. All of these legislators are under, are under email barrage from the other side, from the university and the other side who want, to, who, want to, who want them to roll back these vetoes. They're getting emails, calls, texts. We need to be responsive uh, to these legislators and say, look, we support you in making in, in in voting for the to confirm these vetoes in upholding the governor's vetoes it's the right thing to do we're, we've got your back we're there for you you that you need to make the right vote on this we're going to be supportive of you um uh, this is the time to step up it's an easy thing to do 
uh, just step up and support the governor. It's not something you have to go argue for to make the cuts yourselves. The governor's already made them. Just hold the line uh, on 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 these vetoes. And I've already had email exchanges with several legislators uh, to that effect. Look, the governor's made the decision. If we're ever going to get the state under control, uh, this is the time it's going to happen. He's told, he's laid out a plan for how to do it. Now's the time to, to uphold that plan. If you break, if, the, if, if legislators break and don't support the governor on, on these vetoes, then, then the ball game's over. Uh, we're, we're never, if this, if this legislature with these conservative, fiscal conservatives in it, with this governor at the helm, uh, if we don't make uh, the cuts at this point, we're never going to get uh, the state back under control from a cost standpoint. We're going to have a big discussion on taxes coming up. Um, not a small discussion on taxes, a big discussion on taxes coming up. Um, so the, the, the thing that needs to be done is is all the constituents need to contact the legislators with the legislators with whom they have relationships and say we're behind you support support the governor on these vetoes it's the right thing to do it'll get the state under control don't don't cave in to you know the, the phone call that says i'll just make an exception in this one case support the governor across the board support the governor on these vetoes that that's the critical thing that people can do and it's and and right now is the critical time to be doing it. And uh, again, care to prognosticate quickly here on? Uh, I mean, fifteen minority. Ben Carpenter has said if they'd been treated with more respect, there might be a chance of it. But at this point, he doesn't see that as at all. Uh, and of course, you've got the five or six in the uh, Senate who are feeling, uh, you know, feeling again, kind of the same feel. Um, what do you think is going to happen? You want to you want to prognosticate here for us? There's there may be uh, if they go at it line by line, there may be lines where it's going to be close to maintaining the 16. But frankly, if I I believe that if we get enough constituent support, uh, enough enough people writing to the legislature saying to the legislators saying hold the line, I think we'll get 16 across the board. Uh, as I say, it may be the numbers may vary. Uh, hopefully, it's 20 plus on the university. I mean, if 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 we break on that one, we're done. Uh, but but there may be some of the smaller subsets where uh, uh, where, where individual legis legislators peel off makes it even more important to 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 get to the rock ribbed legislators and say we got your back. We know it's going to be tough votes across the board. But we've got your back on these, um, and I think if the if the constituent supports there, if they feel that constituent support, um, uh, six, it, it'll be a changing number, but sixteen will hold will hold uh, across the line. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budget, my friend. Thank you for sticking over with us uh, over the top of the hour. I appreciate that. Appreciate all you do, and uh, thanks for coming on the program. Michael, as always, thanks for having. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube and SoundCloud pages and keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the weekly top three.